Welcome back to Wrong Sports. Whether you are a first-time listener or a returning listener, when I originally started this channel, I was covering scandals in college sports that may have not gotten enough recognition or ones that I thought needed to be covered more. And you can check out some of them over on the sides or in the playlist to the sides as well. And this channel has branched out a little bit over the last three years since I started the channel. And I wanted to get back to that this month as I cover three more scandals and one other big event from the start of the 1950 decade. A couple of weeks ago, I did How the Year Was One 1950, and I was thinking about doing that again for 1951, but there was so much stuff that happened in 1951 that I wanted to branch out and do them individually. So that's what I'm going to be covering over the next few episodes. And if you haven't watched, I actually did a video about three years ago about the college betting scandal that affected a handful of schools all over the country, but mostly affected New York City college sports forever. And you can check that out in the upper right hand corner or in the playlist along with these videos. But the first scandal that I will be covering will be a huge academic and financial aid scandal at William & Mary that happened not only once, but twice. So yeah, strap on in because this one gets a little out of control. But before I get to the scandal, I want you to quickly go below and subscribe to the channel. Also, ring the bell so you can get updates on when I'm going to be dropping brand new videos. Also, check out my podcast. You can also help out the channel on my Patreon and check out my social media links in the description below. And as always, like and share this video with other college sports fans. But to start the story, I'm going to start with the school, as William & Mary is the second oldest college in the United States. It's actually older than the United States itself, as it was founded in 1693. And due to this being around for so long, it has amazing alumni that built the country, like three presidents are alumni of the school, the first secretary of state, four signers of the Declaration of Independence, and oh yeah, George freaking Washington got his surveyor's license at William & Mary in 1749. But even though they are the second oldest college, they had a few issues in the 1930s and 40s. First, they were quite a small school. As of 2020, the student enrollment is just over 8,000 people. And in 1930, the enrollment was just over 1,500, both of which puts them just above the smallest colleges in Division I. Plus, to go along with that, they were a liberal arts school, but didn't have an identity. And in the late 1930s, they were gaining female enrollment. And those last two things I mentioned became an issue for their president at this time, John Bryan. Bryan wanted to create a strong liberal arts college and increase the masculine image of the school. So he did that through athletics, especially football. They were used to promote the manly factor of the school. And to man up this college, the president would set out to hire a good coach in football and make sure to pay him well so that the football team could get better quicker. He would go out and hire Duke assistant coach Carl Voyle. Along with that, he would help out his new hire by making a decision to attract football players by providing more college resources as financial incentives to his athletic programs to get better quicker. And the money collected from two funds, the Alumni Scholarships Fund and the Loyalty Fund, were channeled almost entirely to athletes. And Coach Voyles was given full control over the football team and wouldn't be focused on recruiting athletes that could academically get into the school, but he was more focused on ones that could win football games. And if he had any issues, then the two athletic funds could help get those athletes in the school and stay in the school. And this strategy would work for the football and basketball programs, as the football program under Voyles went 29-7-3 from 1939 to 1942, including going 9-1-1 in 1942 and beating Navy, Dartmouth, and Oklahoma. Meanwhile, the basketball team under that same time went 54-39 and and also had a winning record in their conference, the Southern Conference. But the 1942 season was the college's best, and due to that, other schools were offering Voiles to be their next head coach, and Auburn would step in to steal him away. And they did it pretty easily, and I'll explain that in just a little bit. But there was bigger news happening, as in 1942, William & Mary would have a new head football coach, but they would also have a brand new president as well. And that new president was named John Pomfret. He was educated at the University of Penn and mostly known for history. He would come into the school and change some things in the athletic department, like the ending of the Alumni Athletic Committee. The Alumni Committee had recently recommended to the Board of Visitors that athletics be curtailed, and Pomfret suggested the creation of a Board of Visitors Athletic Committee to replace it. This was to keep the image of William & Mary being an upstanding liberal arts college, but behind the scenes he told the Board of Visitors Athletic Committee and his new coach to continue recruiting those good athletes to the school. The school would in turn give the athletes aid based on athletic merit or financial need or both. 
as over the next eight years, the school would give 75% of their athletic scholarships based on their physical talents. And if you weren't coming to the school to play a sport, you rarely if ever got financial aid. Also, another reason for these new athletic committees was that President Pomfret would basically be straddling the fence between making his athletic boosters happy and his academic alumni and other committee members happy, and you'll see more examples of this coming up. So with the changes to the new athletic committee, the president would also hire a new football coach. But him straddling the fence, like I mentioned, was also seen here, as he didn't want to get into a bidding war to keep his coach Carl Voiles in 1942. So he basically let him go to Auburn, who paid him about $12,000, almost $5,000 more than Voiles was making at William & Mary. And Pomfret obviously couldn't match that, since, you know, he was still straddling that fence here, and also it was nearly five times as much as what a professor was making at this point, which was considered insane to do. So Pomfret instead went with a cheap replacement in Voiles as he hired assistant coach Rube McCray to be the head coach. And McCray was given a salary of $5,000, which was still more than professors were making, but not nearly as much as what Voiles was making at his highest point. So with the new coach and the war still going on, there would be no football in 1943, since there wouldn't be enough college-age men on campus to play the sport. But Coach McRae was still busy, as along with being the football coach, he was also the basketball coach and he was the baseball coach as well, since again, this was during war, there wasn't a lot of people on campus, everyone had to do multiple jobs. Along with those three jobs, McRae would also be given the athletic director job, which would now give McRae all power over the athletic department, and that also meant the new Board of Visitors Athletic Committee was going to be doing his bidding and working along with him. McRae's first football team would be in 1944. They won a respectable 5-2-1, beating all of their Virginia opponents, but not able to beat NC State or Penn, but they did tie North Carolina, so that's a pretty good tie. The 1945 season would also get better as they went 6-3, again beating all Virginia schools, and they also faced Tennessee and lost to them. But after 1945, the war was over and more athletes were coming back to the country, and McRae was able to increase the team's talent. In 1946, they went 8-2, again not losing to any Virginia teams they faced, and they also beat Maryland. But it was apparent that the team was really good, and they could compete with top, bigger universities on the football field. In 1947, they showed that, as they went 9-2, not losing to a Virginia team again, they were also ranked in the top 20, and they went to the Dixie Bowl to play Arkansas, where they only lost by two points. With the football team doing so good, it would start to spread to the basketball court, too. After McCray gave up basketball coaching duties after the 1945 season, Sam Holt took over for two years and got them to a pretty respectable 500 record over the next two years. But the basketball team would explode over the next four years on the court and off of it with the hiring of Barney Wilson. Wilson played at Tennessee Wesleyan and Eastern Kentucky in basketball and football, but according to this article that I found, he also got his master's in physical education at the University of Kentucky. But Wilson would come to the school and be given free reign to get the best athletes to come to the school, and Wilson would jump right in on that as he had winning records over the next four seasons and three seasons with 20 wins or more. But I'll get back to him because he was the biggest scumbag of them all. And I have to go back to the president straddling the fence between athletics and education because that battle would finally come to a head at the end of the 1940s. Subsidized athletics was becoming a hot topic all around the United States, and with William & Mary straddling that fence trying to battle the explosion of college athletics along with keeping their academic prestige, William & Mary showed that they cared about balancing academics with athletics as they were one of the schools to sign the Sanity Code in 1948, which wanted to promote educational financial aid more so than athletic aid. In addition, the member institutions of the NCAA voted overwhelmingly to abolish full athletic grant and aids, limiting aid to tuition only. Full scholarships could only go to athletes who carried B averages or above. And to enforce its decision, the NCAA created the first death penalty for violators of the code. That is, banning them from the NCAA for a year or two. And you would see that in the 1980s with SMU. And I've also covered that in other episodes on this series. And all of that was very significant because William & Mary wasn't abiding by any of the sanity code. Because yeah, this scheme was at its peak by 1947-1948 as they were changing grades and giving easy classes or fake classes to athletes to give them better grades and keep them playing. 
Oh, and also, I mentioned Rube McRae was running the athletic department, so he knew what was going on, and was able to keep his hands clean with his assistants running this whole jig. Along with that, President Pomfret was good friends with McRae, and even offered him a pay raise due to the fantastic 1947 season. The pay raise was the same money that the school was paying McRae's predecessor, so that made Pomfret even more of a fan of McRae's. Bud Pomfret knew of the athletes not being up to educational standard, but didn't do anything to stop it. He also didn't want this to get out to the public, since it would tarnish the William & Mary image. But he really didn't have to worry until 1949. That was because William & Mary would hire a new dean of the college. They went with their dean of marine science, Nelson Marshall, to take over. And Marshall was an outsider to people on campus, as he mostly worked off campus, so he wasn't given a heads up about what was happening in the athletic department at this point. Marshall's predecessor knew of the athletes not being up to academic standards, but approved of helping out athletics over academics, which put him at odds with his fence-straddling president. So while Marshall was still settling into his position, the football team was obviously getting even better, as in 1948 they had seven NFL draft choices, which is the most they ever had, but the team went 7-2-2. Two two. Plus they were playing a big time schedule, as they played Boston College, who they tied, and Arkansas, who they beat. Plus they were invited to the Delta Bowl to play Oklahoma A&M and they beat them 20 to nothing. So yeah, it was clear this team was getting really awesome. And the 1949 team ended the decade with another winning season as they went 6 and 4. But this schedule was even more big time as they played Pitt, Houston, Michigan State and Arkansas going 2 and 2 against them and getting more media attention. William & Mary during the 1940s was one of the best teams in the nation, as they went 70, 22, and 6 during that decade. They went to two bowl games, along with having 24 NFL draft picks. Oh, and they also had an NFL Hall of Famer in their tackle, Lou Kriegmer. So that decade ended on a high note, but this decade would not start all that well. And you can check out the 1950 college football season, how the year was won, in the upper right-hand corner right now. But the 1950 season was the kickoff to the decade where a lot of things changed for college football. But William & Mary would probably have the craziest decade, as this 1950 season didn't start all that well for them as they went 4-7. and seven. But that not-so-great year might have been because the walls were quickly closing in on Coach McRae, Coach Wilson, and President Pomfret. With someone actually looking out for the faculty now, as the Dean Nelson Marshall would finally start to find some of the shady stuff that was going on. Along with that, he also had some help, as he ended up teaming up with the Dean of Students and the Registrar at the school, J. Wilfred Lambert. And they started to find all sorts of scummy stuff going on. First up, they found that McRae and basketball coach Barney Wilson were recruiting athletes to come to the school that weren't academically eligible to make it in. You knew that already. Second, though, when the athletes made it to William & Mary, they were supplemented with room and board and other perks due to the athletic committee helping them out. Along with that, the committee and the coaches worked together to keep it under wraps by giving the athletes jobs and hiking up the pay rates so that they could make all of what they were worth. Third, due to McCray being a full-time professor now on campus, which came with his new contract extension he got in 1947, he was able to teach a class and give his athletes better grades to keep them on the field. A big example of this was when some of his athletes, who most of them were physical education majors, were found to have received grades for summer school school courses when they weren't actually there. And it wasn't just one either, as there were nine such cases. One such case was really egregious, and unfortunately I don't have the name of the athlete, but he received a B grade in four courses during the summer of 1949. The only thing was, he was never on campus. They found out he was a truck driver for a company in Newark, New Jersey. Finally, along with giving athletes easy classes and free grades, there were findings of grade changes. An example was when Nelson and Lambert found a transcript of one athlete who received an F in a sociology class due to the student never showing up for the class. The final grade though was changed from an F to a B. Now the reason that the change was found was due to the professor of the class being on the faculty athletic committee which was working with the pair in this investigation and he came across that grade change. All this stuff was being done under the athletic director, which was McRae, and he is pretty bad. But remember I mentioned the basketball coach Barney Wilson and I said he was a scumbag and I said we'll get back to him? 
Well, we're getting back to him now because he was more scummy than McRae because along with changing grades for his athletes, he was making some money on the side. Yeah, that was because this guy had a little side business running as he was using female students as his secretaries and they did all of the office work for him and they would also help out in the scheme. With the secretaries helping him out and getting paid by the university, Wilson would take 10% of the secretary wages in return for Wilson giving them the position. Some of these secretaries were also girlfriends of basketball players, which made this scheme even dirtier. But yeah, this guy was taking money from students who were doing illegal things for him. But this whole little kickback side business didn't come out until a few years later, as he threatened players and these female students with expulsion if they didn't run the scheme. And yeah, this guy's awful. But let's get back to the deans, as they would bring their entire investigation to the president, who of course didn't want this coming out to the public. So he instead had McCray clean it up towards late 1949. The way of cleaning up this scheme was to find a fall guy and fire him. So McCray's choice was an assistant coach. It was later revealed to be Al Vandue, who was a former football player until 1946, then played a year in the NFL before coming back to William & Mary to coach in 1947. With the firing, it made it look like William & Mary was clean, but of course they weren't. Instead, all of the scummy shit would still continue through 1950, but the two deans were in pursuit to make this stop and wanting to stop money going to athletes and instead go to academic students. The deans would bring up the fact that athletes were only graduating at a rate of just barely one-third, while a regular freshman not coming to school for sports was graduating at a rate of three-quarters. But the beginning of the end would finally happen in April 1951, when Dean Nelson went to President Pomfret and put in his resignation. This was a risky move, as it could make Nelson look bad in the future to other schools wanting to hire him, but it also put President Pomfret in a tough position. Because if Nelson were to resign, he'd have to put in his reasons for it, which would be, of course, that there was a massive academic scandal happening. And Pomfret told him not to do that because he wanted to delay a little bit more. The delay was because McRae had a ton of power at the college right now, and the Board of Visitors Athletic Committee had even more power. On top of that, Pomfret and McRae's friendship was really strong. Eventually, Pomfret announced that a committee of five from the Board of Visitors to investigate this and give them a resolution on the matter. And this was all seen as another delay tactic, because it was. So Dean Nelson turned up the heat again, with more threats of leaving, and it would finally force President Pomfret to end this. The end would finally happen right around July 4th, 1951, as President Pomfret announced to the Board of Visitors and this new committee of five that they needed to not investigate the matter. That was because he gave the option to Rube McRae and Barney Wilson to resign, but to announce their resignation towards the end of 1951, so as to give them some time to get new jobs for the 1952 season. Yes, the president was more inclined to protect the two cheating coaches over his own college, but anyway, the coaches would accept the resignation, and the president hoped to bury the scandal as they left. But clearly that didn't happen, as midway through August, Dean Nelson would write a letter to that fired assistant coach Al Vandeway, offering an apology to him as he got too much of the blame for this whole scandal. That letter somehow made its way to the local newspaper, the Newport News, who published it. And once this letter came out, the scandal was shown to everyone, and the media came to William and Mary and uncover all this madness. Over the next year, the football coach, basketball coach, president, and several faculty would all resign. President Pomfret's resignation was pretty embarrassing, but he ended up running a library for the rest of his life, so he was fine. And I really wish the president would have gotten some sort of punishment, but he played this game right as he straddled the fence, so he doesn't look nearly as bad as the coaches do. Basketball coach Barney Wilson, again, who was the biggest scumbag of all, would never coach again, but he would run several businesses, so at least he never got to coach again. Meanwhile, though, the main man, Rube McRae, would also never coach again, but he would also live a relatively easy, quiet life, and it's tough to find things that he did after this point. Meanwhile, at the school, there was chaos, with the faculty fighting with the Board of Visitors Athletic Committee, each wanting the other to leave the college. To solve things immediately, the new president would step in to put in stricter academic standards, and the athletic budget would be cut by a third over the next few years. 
1951 season for the football team wasn't that bad, as they still had some really good talent as they went 7-3. and three. They were coached by interim coach Marvin Bass. And funny story about him, because I later found out he got into William & Mary, even though he had a lower than acceptable GPA, and I'm not sure if he even graduated William & Mary, but he did play there from 1940 to 1942, and was a longtime assistant. So even though McCray was gone, his connections were still hanging around the college. In addition, the basketball team in 1951-1952 had a winning record under another one-year interim coach, but the next season for both teams would be very different. This was because the new college president, Alvin Duke Chandler, put in those academic standards, and now the alumni was on the faculty's side. This would also decrease the power of the Board of Visitors Athletic Committee. Also, I mentioned earlier about the athletic budget being cut, and to show that they were lowering their athletic footprint, they announced that over the next few years, they would no longer be playing upper echelon teams. And William & Mary had future games scheduled against teams like Texas, Penn State, Michigan State, and Oklahoma, and that final announcement meant that those games would not happen. And I'll get back to the football team in just a second, because there was another scandal that would happen there. But I'm going to tie a bow right now on their basketball team, because their 1952-1953 season wouldn't be that bad, but it was clear that their talent level wasn't really there anymore. Along with that, their new basketball coach, Boyd Sin Baird, was working on a shoestring budget, he hardly had any recruiting budget, hardly had any assistant coaches, and I say that because Baird also doubled as an assistant coach for football for the next several years. The basketball team would play a reduced schedule for the next four years, and they only had one winning record. That was in 1953-1954, when the team went 9-4, and four. so clearly they played a reduced schedule there. But again, a lot of schools didn't play them or schedule them due to all the turmoil that was happening at the school and also not knowing if William & Mary could actually field a basketball team. But let's get back to football because there was another scandal that would happen and it would be another cheating scandal. It would happen in January 1952 and it's centered on misconduct and stealing of an ROTC final exam and distributing it to other students in the class. Along with that, there would also be other violations of the university's honor code. Upwards of 30 students were expelled from the school due to that and 8 out of 30 were football players. With those players getting kicked out, nearly half of the remaining players would also transfer out of the school because they could see the writing on the wall. And they wanted to play at a big-time football school, or at least at a school that wasn't going through all this crap. Now with the reduced football roster, it wasn't a nice present for the new athletic director and head coach of football, Jack Freeman. Freeman played at Notre Dame for a year in 1940, before playing at William & Mary for two years, he then went on to coach high school football in Pennsylvania, only to come back to William & Mary to be an assistant in 1951, before becoming coach the next year. And Freeman would accept being the coach just after the second cheating scandal, and just after the school basically cut all the funding and scholarships. This meant that Freeman would be starting his first season with a reduced roster, and the 1952 squad wasn't so bad. They actually went 4-5. and five. It wouldn't be a big story of their reduced roster until the 1953 season, where they were called the Iron Indians. That was because they only had 24 players on their roster, with 14 returning starters. So most of these players had to play both sides of the ball for all 60 minutes. Oh, and also, it was tough for him to add additional players because the school wasn't offering scholarships anymore. So unless you wanted to walk on and get kicked around with no chance of any scholarship, you could, but few students did. And the 1953 season for the William & Mary football team would be a great movie because it was nothing like any school has ever had to go through. Besides not having a full team, they also didn't have a full coaching squad. So he had to use people already on campus or go without. And like I mentioned, the basketball coach was one of his assistants. To go along with that, Freeman had to curtail practice into basically conditioning practice with barely any hitting. And he wanted them to be fresh for the game and not get injured during practice. With all those handicaps, William and Mary were given really no chance in the preseason media articles, and after the last cheating scandal, William and Mary had to field calls from Navy and Cincinnati, who they were playing in early October, to answer if they still wanted to play their game. But William and Mary would play, and they would actually shock a lot of people, as they started their season with an upset over Wake Forest, and then they tied Navy, who were one of the top Eastern squads at this point. The team would be 5-2-1, but after a one-point loss to VMI, injuries finally crept up with them, and with a chance to win their conference, they would lose their final two games. 
William and Mary would end their season 5-4-1, and one, but they had only 24 players to start the season, and at the end of the season, they had just barely 20, so coming out with a winning record was pretty amazing. The scandals and the minimizing of the athletic budget made it really hard for William and Mary sports to be good, and it stayed with them for a while. The football team's winning record in 1953 would be their last until 1965. Along with that, their basketball team was basically under 500 for the next 30 years, as they didn't make a postseason tournament until 1983. The punishment that William & Mary gave themselves was basically the death penalty without actually getting it by the NCAA. But at least they learned and haven't been in trouble again, and actually got used to the reduced athletic budget and have won in the future. I wish I could say that this forced other colleges to stop breaking rules, but it didn't, and there would be more scandals that would rock college sports over the rest of the 1950s, and in the next episode I will cover another academic scandal that would become bigger because it happened at West Point, and it would cause aftershocks all over the college football landscape. And thank you so much for checking out this episode of Wrong Sports and the William & Mary Academic Scandal of the 1950s. Again, this will be a four-part series, so be on the lookout next week for the next video on Army. And then episode three will be about the Johnny Bright incident of 1951, before I will end it on the end of the San Francisco football team that ended in 1951. So stay tuned for all of that. Again, make sure you go below and subscribe to the channel, please. Like and share this video with other college football fans, and check out all of my social media, my Patreon, and my podcast in the description below. Have a great rest of your day.